glad to have Avicho here with us. Uh, first, let me briefly introduce Avicho. Avicho is a successful serial entrepreneur with executive ex experience at Google and Facebook, which acquired his previous company. Avicho is also the co-founder and general partner at Electric Capital, uh, a, a fund uh, particularly focused in cryptocurrencies, blockchain-based businesses, uh, and fintech companies and marketplaces. Hi, Avicho. Uh, it's great to have you here. Hey, Don. Thanks for having me. Great. So let's get started. Uh, so, Avicho, you have been uh, in the blockchain space for, uh, for quite a long time. And uh, you have been really active in the space. Uh, I know you have a lot of really uh, interesting uh, 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 opinions and uh, deep thoughts in the space that actually the community in general has been very excited about. So, uh, so when you think about where blockchain will be in five years, what trends in crypto now do you think will flourish? Um, well, first, thanks, thanks for having me. It's good to see you. Um, you know, the way we think about blockchain and crypto is um, we, we come from an engineering background. And so kind of our lens on it has always been, what is this platform or what are these platforms and what are these technologies uniquely good at? And that's usually where adoption starts. Um, and I think if you look at the underlying technology, I always find it useful to contrast it to the previous generation because I think one of the mistakes that people make is they just see what was successful on the previous generation of platforms and then assume that those same things will be successful here. Uh, and I think we kind of saw that kind of in like 2017, 2016, 2017 with the first generation of uh, crypto projects that were launched. It was a lot of it was like stuff that worked on the internet, but decentralized was kind of the, the pattern. Um, but really, if you look at the tech, what you realize pretty quickly is that um, the the platforms just make fundamentally different trade-offs. And so, um, you know, on the internet, it was all about speed and scalability and throughput. Um, and, and to get all of these things, we traded off our privacy. Um, we gave up ownership of our data. Um, we, uh, you know, we didn't have, um, you know, seizure resistance. We, we sort of like gave up all these things to get all the properties that make like Facebook and Google kind of work. Um, and what's fascinating about, about blockchain and crypto is we kind of turned that on its head. And so we said, you know, we'll give up some speed and scalability and throughput, but in return, we get to control the data. We get to have data immutability. We get to have seizure, seizure resistance of assets. We get all these, you know, we get privacy in a different way. And so we get all these unique properties. Um, and so if you look at it through that lens, all of a sudden you say, well, where do these kinds of properties matter? And our opinion has always been that the place where these properties tend to really matter um, are where they will flourish and specifically places where the internet did not do a good job of, of meeting people's needs. And so we've always said things like um, uh, finance and things that deal with money would, would be a fascinating place. Uh, games are always an early adoption use case of, of any new platform, uh, potentially healthcare uh, because, you know, things like privacy and data mutability really matter with healthcare. Um, and, and, and what's fascinating is if you look at where did the internet really cause massive disruptions uh, the internet disrupted things like media, but if you look at the biggest companies in the world from 40 years ago, well, the finance companies and the healthcare companies are still kind of there, whereas most of the other companies over the last 40 years have been, you know, whether it's retail or media or whatever, have been disrupted by the internet. Um, and so we think actually the combination of, of this being such a good fit for those industries and so many of those industries being so so backwards and old and, and resistant to technology creates this really interesting uh, intersection and this storm. And so we spend a lot of our time thinking about what are the building blocks in uh, finance, in decentralized finance, in uh, privacy preserving technologies um, that can be applied to things like healthcare that, um, that now are ready and, and actually you can build solutions that are truly unique and different and new and they might be really disruptive to the existing company. So those are some of the areas that, that we focus on. Mm -hmm. Great, great, yeah, thanks. Uh, and uh, for you, you've worked at startups and large enterprises in the past. So how do you foresee enterprises using blockchain technologies in the future? And what are the blockers for them to get to mass product, uh, adoption? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, you know, it kind of depends on how you, how you define enterprises. I think, um, you know, there's sort of, there's uh, enterprises, which usually means big companies. And so there are enterprises today, and then there are the enterprises of tomorrow, which are startups today. Um, and I think they'll use them in very different ways. So I think the companies that are enterprises today will generally look at it through the lens of how do we do the things that we do today, but more efficiently. 
And so how do we take uh, you know, the business that we have and make it 2%, 5%, 10%, 20% more efficient? Um, it's generally very hard for large and existing enterprises to do something dramatically different than what they do today. Um, and in part, it's just the nature of, of how organizations are set up, right? There are, there are goals and there are skills that people have, and there are things that people can measure inside a big company. And when you can measure them, then you want to improve them. And so uh, what these large organizations will do is they'll try to improve the things that they can already measure, which ultimately means they'll try to make their existing businesses more efficient. Um, I think that some of those will be interesting. I think some of those will, um, uh, will, will have meaningful impact, whether it's in you know, banks being able to move money across country boundaries more easily, um, or uh, you know, healthcare systems being able to share data, things like that I think will, will have uh, impact. Uh, but in a lot of ways, I think those might be incremental um, in that they might give you 10 or 20 or 30 percent improvements on things. The really step function changes, I think, will come uh, through the combination of new platforms and startups because there's no baggage with startups. Um, and so, um, you know, it's a little reason uh, like reasoning by analogy is always a little bit tricky. But uh, if you look at the, the history of the Internet, for example, you know, if you went back to the 90s, I think a lot of people said, oh, this is the information superhighway. And so obviously the big winners in this space are going to be CNN and the New York Times. That's really who benefits from the internet. And in retrospect, that just sounds silly, right? Like the big winners were YouTube and Facebook and Google and right, all of the native companies that, that were built uh, around this new technology. Even, even in something like retail, it wasn't Walmart that really won big. It was Amazon. Um, because what Amazon did was they built their entire organization around the new technology and embracing the new technology. Um, and so I think the really interesting stuff, the companies that are going to be worth $100 billion plus or the networks that might be worth a trillion dollars are going to be brand new things. And, and they might look weird and different. Um, I mean, if you look at all of the biggest companies on the Internet, a lot of the things that they do are really weird. Um, you know, it's like you're going to, uh, you know, get into a stranger's car and go spend the week at a stranger's apartment and none of these people are going to kill you. And by the way, while you're there, you're going to like broadcast to, you know, a hundred million strangers on the internet, what your you know, opinions are. It's it, a lot of this stuff is like kind of bizarre, right? So it'll look weird initially. Um, but I think a lot of startups uh, will embrace this um, and they'll do brand new things with it that, that will look weird and different. Um, but those will end up being really big companies as well. And, and so actually a lot of the enterprise use cases will end up starting with startups. And then those startups will just happen to be the fastest growing businesses and they'll end up becoming enterprises. Um, and it's great because actually for those companies, the blockers are, are very few. Like they don't have large teams of people that need approval. Um, but I think you'll see both. So I think you'll see some big companies um, embracing it, mostly for efficiency gains. And then the startups, I think, will embrace it like truly natively to, to extract new value and build new things that, that the enterprises of today don't, can't even imagine. Yeah, that's, uh, that's really fascinating. That's, uh, that's a uh, great point. It's interesting that uh, also like for, for someone like me who actually have been uh, doing you know, both blockchain and also AI machine learning in the past, it's actually interesting to see that uh, for, for AI machine learning, it seems that, uh, of course, it can help both the startups and the big companies, but it seems that it's helping, at least so far, it's helping the big companies more. Uh, whereas I think I very much agree with you, it, like blockchain is such a disruptive new technology uh, that actually you'll need to essentially rethink both in terms of the business models and also uh, the actual ecosystem and, and so on. So that actually startups may be uh, the best place to, uh, to grow the technology and really have uh, fast growth and real impact. Yeah, actually, you know, the, the business model point, I think is a really interesting one too. It, it, that's, that's another place where with, with crypto networks and sort of uh, the ability to have tokens, um, I think you change the kinds of businesses that can be started and who can, who can make money in the value capture mechanisms. Um, and so I think that also unlocks the potential for, for startups to have new monetization mechanisms, which then of course means you'll have new companies, um, which, you know, I think you're right with AI, ML, a lot of it, you did get some new companies, but a lot of it benefited the incumbents. Um, and I think in part it's because like, yeah, the, the alignment of business models. Um, I mean, what's, what's, uh, what's your sense is that you think that like, because you, you also have some experience on the AI ML side. And so is your, in your experience, do you think this is fundamentally different? Like, do you think blockchain platforms are going to unlock more startups versus big companies and a, than AI ML did? Or I'm kind of curious how you think about it. Right. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a very good question. I think for AI and uh, machine learning, so first of all, uh, really what it is, you need to have a huge amount of data. 
uh, and uh, of course the big companies actually going back to what we talked about earlier like all these incumbents as they have grown you know bigger and bigger like they actually what they are doing what their mode is is actually the data so for startups it's actually very difficult to compete with the large companies because the large companies are the ones who have data they have users data they have uh, lots of data and and also then as you use this data you improve the existing uh, you improve the user experience of the you know their user base and so on so in general I, I think yeah, that, that that's one of the reasons I think so far we've seen that AI machine learning actually helps more uh, on the incumbents than than the startups. I, um, I've heard you in the past talk about like the data economy and the responsible data economy in a context oasis. Um, I'm I'm kind of curious how you think about all of the data pieces um, with blockchain. Like, do you think that 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 data model, the data monetization model that the internet companies has uh, have had for the last 20 years, do you think that changes with blockchain? Like, is, is that disruptive to that model at all? Right, right. Yes, yeah, that's a good question. I think, um, I mean, so so that's why, like, even going back to what you were saying earlier, so with the, with the internet, of course, it has benefited everyone tremendously, um, but at the same time, right, it comes at some cost as well. So, so today, uh, and also even you know, with the AI machine learning and with, the, uh, with other digital, uh, digitization, data is a key driver of modern economy, but a lot of this data is also really sensitive. And uh, how to really properly handle the sensitive data has really posed many challenges for both the individuals and also for businesses. So for the individuals now, we are seeing that people are talking about usage of other products because users actually uh, users are losing control of their data. They don't really know what's happening to their data. And also a lot of their data is actually being sold without users' awareness, even though uh, sometimes they are sold under the umbrella of uh, anonymization. But we actually know that this anonymization really is not sufficient in protecting uh, users' uh, data privacy. Uh, and also users are not really getting sufficient direct benefits from their data because in because of the current um, power dynamics, users actually are not, uh, they don't really, there's no clear rights uh, for users to their data and the users don't have control of their data. And hence it's actually difficult for users to gain more uh, fair value from uh, their data. And also for businesses, businesses actually su are suffering as well. So businesses also don't want to see that, uh, you know, their users are losing trust. Uh, from their service, and also a lot of businesses are still suffering from large-scale uh, security data uh, breaches, uh, and uh, and also uh, it's becoming more and more expensive and cumbersome for them to comply with the privacy regulations like uh, GDPR and CCPA, and uh, also and also more importantly, it's actually still very difficult for businesses to utilize data. There are a few like big incumbents that they have data, but actually for most businesses, they one like they would like to utilize more data, um, but still a lot of data is being uh, stored in data silos, so that uh, uh, because of privacy reasons and so on, so it's actually difficult for businesses in general to to utilize data. And for example, for medical researchers, also it's difficult for them to get access to medical data to help them uh, develop better cures for diseases and so on. So, so overall, we are seeing that uh, the world definitely is growing in the direction of just getting bigger and bigger data economy. There has been statistics uh, showing that uh, the world has you know, trillions of dollars in data economy already, and it's only growing exponentially uh, you know, as for, in the foreseeable future. Uh, but a lot of the data economy has many, many challenges. And we think that uh, uh, for uh, essentially we actually need to build a, a new paradigm, which is a more responsible data economy that actually help address the challenges for both sides to help users to better maintain control of their data and rights to data and uh, so that the, the data can be utilized in a privacy preserving way, in a more responsible way, and also help, help users to gain more value from their data and also on the other hand for businesses 
to provide the technologies and tools needed for the businesses to essentially be a more responsible player in the space as well to better help users to maintain control of their rights but still uh, be able to benefit the businesses to utilize the data but in a responsible way. So that's overall, we think that uh, it's really important as the world moves uh, into the future. I'm, I'm curious, do you think it starts, I mean, I think the, the criticism I usually hear around a, a lot of this data stuff is that most users don't really care. And I'm kind of curious what you think about that. Like, do you think user, users actually care or do enough users actually care? Um, so, I mean, maybe a, a better way to ask that question is, do you think, um, do you think there are enough businesses that care that you can kind of get this uh, data economy off the ground? Or do you think that there are actually like a small number of users who care a lot and there's some like certain use cases that you can go after that, that where privacy really matters and data ownership really matters and, and that is enough to get it off the ground. Like, where do you, where do you think all this stuff starts, I guess? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really good question. So I feel that's why I think privacy is not just about privacy, it's to protect user sensitive information. I think it's more important to help users establish their rights to data and help users to maintain control of their data. And ultimately what this will lead to is will lead to a better power dynamics for the users. So users actually will be the one who actually has more power. And then, and then with more power, um, the, this negotiation, negotiation table, this will help users to gain uh, more fair value uh, from their data and uh, for uh, general creates more uh, benefits for the users as well. So, so as a one example, like today, <coughs> For example, uh, because users don't have control over their data, then once the user uh, allows a third party to use their data, then users lose control of their data. And then the third party has a copy of the user's data, the third party can do whatever uh, it wants to, uh, right? For example, sell user's data and, and so on. Um, but if, uh, in, for example, in the Oasis platform, we provide a different uh, solution uh, where users can maintain control of their data. And that the, uh, when user can allow a third party to use user's data, but then this third party has to use user's data in this uh, secure execution environments, so that uh, uh, the third party doesn't uh, get a raw copy of user's data uh, during the computation. Uh, so that even when uh, the user is allowing the third party to use user's data, but the user still is able to maintain control uh, of his or her data. And then in this case, the third party can, if the third party wants to use user's data again, it still needs to get user's consent and needs to, for example, offer proper rewards and so on. So, so in this case, users are, right, are actually in the, in the driver's seat. Uh, so users actually can, uh, again, it's important to have this, <clears throat> uh, they be able to maintain their rights to data. So also this is what we call like a, a data tokenization, where the OSIS mm -hmm. platform essentially enables this concept of uh, tokenizing the data that actually helps create a new type of assets that we call data assets. So now just like, uh, in the traditional setting, users have financial assets. Today, most users have financial assets. Um, but uh, like, like uh, you know, having you know, your, your cash funds or your stock or your house uh, and, uh, and so on, so other type of properties. Um, but here, uh, in the future, we can see that more and more parts of uh, anybody's, uh, including users, individuals, and businesses, uh, their assets actually will be more and more in the digital form, like uh, data actually will become an increasingly more important and more valuable uh, type of value uh, for an individual or for a business. And hence, um, this notion of data asset, I think, is also a really important uh, part, a really important uh, 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 notion going forward for users, uh, or for, for users are entities, uh, essentially their value. And hence with the, the OSS platform, uh, it's, uh, it's unique capabilities. It's the first time to enable such um, establishments of, the, uh, of data assets and also being able to enforce uh, the rights 
uh, on the data assets, you know, when the data is being utilized. And so we hope that this actually can really help change the dynamics and help enable uh, this more responsible data economy. And I think right. this, right, I think people will care and uh, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so the data tokenization, is, I think, is really interesting and cool. So um, how would that work exactly? So would I, um, I mean, you and I have spent a lot of time talking about it, but I think it's, it might be something that, that others um, don't have as much familiarity with. So with data tokenization, um, is it all of my data is now tokenized and I can give it out piecemeal to different people? Or is it that there's like a basket of data that is packaged up somehow for different apps to use? Or how, how exactly does that work inside Oasis? Yeah, that's a very good question. So there's a lot of flexibility to this. So first of all, uh, in terms of the, the notion of data tokenization of the state assets, uh, there's um, at least two parts to it. So one is uh, on the blockchain, and the blockchain can help provide an immutable ledger of uh, users' rights to data and also their policies of how they want their data to be utilized. Uh, so let me give you an example in uh, a, actually a recent uh, a beta launch on the Oasis platform uh, in the domain of uh, genomic data. So Nebula Genomics is a genomic company uh, that actually partnered with, uh, with Oasis. Uh, they have launched their uh, a new uh, beta service on the Oasis platform to help uh, users. And this will be the first time actually users become owners of their genomic data. And what happens is that this uh, this right to the user's genomic data is locked on the, uh, on the blockchain and, uh, and also together with the policy of how the user wants this data to be utilized. For example, in this case, if the user uh, wants to uh, uh, give consent to the genomic company to allow the genomic company to run genomic analysis on, uh, on the user's data and uh, provide the anal analysis results to the user, then, so this will be reflected uh, in, the, in the policy uh, on the blockchain as well. And, and then, uh, uh, then the OSIS platform also provides this secure computing uh, capability uh, where now this genomic company can run uh, the genomic analysis on user's data in this secure execution environment. So what this allows is, so first of all, uh, because of the tight coupling and combination between the secure execution environments and this uh, blockchain, uh, this distributed ledger, so first of all, the, the computation can only be run once the secure execution environment checks uh, according to the blockchain that this uh, computation is allowed. And also once this computation is allowed, uh, user's data, the genomic data now will be um, uh, will be computed over in the secure execution environments. Uh, for example, doing the genomic analysis by the genomic uh, company. Uh, but in this case, the secure execution environment to provide, uh, protects the confidentiality uh, of, the, of the user's data, uh, such that the genomic company, uh, outside of the secure execution environment, won't be able to uh, access uh, user's data and hence, after the computation is over, if the genomic company wants to run the analysis again, it actually still needs to go through uh, the user's permission uh, and so on. So really, uh, this is the first demonstration showing that how users can maintain control of their data and also at the same time still enable the data to be utilized and in this case, utilized in a privacy-preserving way. Uh, where their data is not being leaked and it's not uh, being stolen, uh, and so on. So, so in this way, essentially, it created this uh, new type of assets, data assets, uh, through this data tokenization, again, by actually combining uh, the blockchain logging users' rights to data and their policies of how users, data, uh, users want their data to be used, and coupled together with this enforcement mechanism, which is the secure execution environment. And also in this case, uh, as users' data is being used, uh, the, the usage of the data will also be locked in the blockchain. So the blockchain actually can maintain an immutable record of when the user's data has been used and who and how the user's data has been utilized. 
Very interesting. It, it actually reminds me a little bit of um, of like credit scores in in traditional finance as well. It's just like this really valuable asset of everything you've done, and it gets passed around, and and third parties make a lot of money off of it, but actually individuals don't. Do you think there are applications of this to to finance and, and DeFi as well? So this idea of data tokenization. Right. Right. That's that's a great question. So this is the area. And that certainly we have been exploring as well. So, so, so far I've talked about data tokenization and data assets in essentially medical data. So for example, your genomic data, and of course can extend to other types of healthcare and medical data as well. And another really uh, important domain is the financial domain. Again, users has a lot of uh, data, their purchase history, their, uh, their bank account information, all that, so there's a lot of uh, valuable uh, financial uh, data uh, and information for users as well. And again, so far, actually, a lot of that data actually has been sold without users' uh, knowledge of the times uh, for other parties to gain uh, benefits and advantage and so on without users actually getting the proper benefits. And using this type of uh, OSIS type of uh, technology, uh, it actually can help users to better maintain control of their financial data as well. So just like what you just mentioned, so in this case, instead of the genomic data, we can swap the genomic data uh, with the user's financial data. So for example, uh, the OSIS platform will actually have uh, integration with the certain financial APIs, uh, like Plaid, which is uh, uh, very uh, uh, like a widely uh, adopted uh, financial APIs. Uh, so from that, actually, users can create, can tokenize, actually, their financial data uh, as well. And, and then and this financial data can then actually be used for computing uh, credit scores, risk scores for the user. And then from the scores, then users actually could uh, potentially get better loans uh, and also uh, may get uh, other like, better services as well. So as one, um, as one example, actually, on the OSS uh, platform, there are already third parties that, uh, that is actually building services using capabilities mm. like this for providing better mortgage uh, interest uh, to users and so on. So yes, it's another really exciting domain uh, where, again, being, in, being able to maintain control uh, of uh, you know, uh, users' financial data and so on can really help users to gain uh, to gain more benefits. Yeah, that's cool. Is that is the is the plat integration with like the the mortgage interest rate calculation, all that stuff? Is that already live? That's already like that's already working on Oasis. So right now it's still in uh, like POC stage. Uh, so with the genomic data, uh, there's already a beta launch. Wow. Uh, and but with the right, so with the, the financial service, uh, so it's it's in POC stage. Wow, that's super cool. I, that's actually I didn't I didn't realize it was that far along. I know we talked about it sort of theoretically in the past, but that's super cool that it's already it's being built already and being tested. That's cool. That's right. great. Um, uh, I don't know how you want to. Uh, this part hopefully will will trim out. But uh, how do you want to how do you want to end it? Um, we can keep talking. Are there other points that you wanted to hit? I wanted to make sure we got like the data tokenization and DeFi and all that stuff in. Are there other points that you wanted to hit? Yeah, I guess this part. Oh, maybe we can just tie this a little bit more to DeFi, like in the sense sure. that, uh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, um, so Don, so um, the idea of like, um, uh, you know, bridging to credit scores in, in sort of traditional finance or legacy finance um, makes a lot of sense. Do you think there, there are tie-ins for like DeFi? I think that's that sort of topic du jour these days with, with the Ethereum ecosystem. Um, do you think there are applications of this idea of um, data tokenization for DeFi as well? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so, so if we look at DeFi today, uh, DeFi, uh, of course, has a lot of innovation and so on. Uh, but there are also many challenges and limitations. So for example, lending on DeFi today is only uh, over collateralized. Mm. So essentially, sometimes you have to have money in order to, yeah. <laughs> to borrow more money, which doesn't seem to, <laughs> right? Yeah. It's not very in line with the ethos of, of where a lot of people are coming from, of like the whole idea was to invent a new system. And, and we created actually like, we borrowed the worst parts of the old system, which is like, the, you know, 
only the people who have a ton of money can make more money, which is kind of the opposite, I think, of what a lot of people right. want to do. Right, right, right. Exactly, exactly. So if you look at in the traditional uh, finance, um, uh, and the characterization is actually a really important part, and it's something even more important than this over Um yeah. But when you do that, then really you need to know more about the borrower. You need to know, uh, right, the, the credit score, the risk scores, and, and so on. So this is one example of how Oasis platform can really help. As we uh, just discussed, the Oasis platform can actually uh, help users to uh, using their uh, financial and other behavioral information and so on to really create um, much better credit score and uh, risk score, and also doing all this in a privacy preserving way where users are still maintaining control of their data. So then in, in this way, it can really help DeFi to grow bigger, to, uh, and to get to more of the mainstream uh, by actually offering a broader uh, user population uh, with uh, this um, undercaracterized uh, loans, for example. And that's, that's one example. Another example that's uh, another direction I'm really excited about is actually for the growing DeFi in new ways. So for example, again, today's DeFi managers deal with uh, these traditional financial assets. Um, but uh, what, uh, with what I just talked about, we have the, the OSIS platform enables this completely new type of assets, which is data assets. So when you combine data assets and, uh, and decentralized finance and DeFi, essentially, it suddenly opens up a completely new, uh, new domain that I think nobody has really thought much mm -hmm. about before. Nobody has really done anything about it. I think it's really brand new. So by combining DeFi and data assets, data assets essentially can become a, a new primitive in DeFi. So, so on one hand, this data assets can help enhance uh, existing uh, DeFi capabilities, like what we just mentioned, the under -culturalization. Um, but also, I'm really excited to see there can be new uh, products, new financial products, new services uh, that uh, by combining DeFi and this new type of uh, data assets, that we can have even new types of uh, uh, right, assets being created and new values being created and complete new uh, financial mechanisms uh, being created as well. And, and also, I hope that this, in the end, is not just about you know, people making more money and so on. And I really do hope that they can actually lead to better ways to create uh, uh, more societal benefits. So for example, by actually, uh, so with the data assets, one can, uh, so for example, just like uh, uh, liquidity mining, users can do liquidity staking and so on. Again, there you have to have money in order to participate. But with the data asset, everybody has data, and everybody can have their data assets. And uh, some of these data assets, even though the person may not have uh, a lot of money, but their data asset actually could be very valuable. So for example, with, yeah. for someone who has a rare medical uh, condition, uh, that uh, their medical data could be much more mm. valuable than someone, somebody else who has a lot more money. Right? So this actually is a very interesting uh, democratization and uh, even playing uh, grounds. For users, and then now with the, these uh, data assets, users can stake just like doing liquidity staking, they can do data staking so they can stake their data into these pools that we call data trusts. And mm -hmm. consumers could then uh, utilize the data in this data trust and then also provide for some payment and so on, and users can get data yield. And also, we hope that we can create lots and lots of this type of data trusts. Uh, that can also lead to societal benefits. For example, users, given that users can still maintain control of their data even when their data is being staked in this uh, in this data trust. Mm -hmm. So then we hope that the more users will be more open to, to participate. And, and then we can imagine having this data trust with uh, lots of users, for example, medical data or other types of data that can help medical researchers to more easily gain access to to medical data for to help them to do their medical research and uh, help develop the cures for diseases and, and so on. That's so. really interesting. So, like putting on my investor hat, just to mirror that back to you, I think there there are two things that jump out that are really really interesting and in all the uh, you know kind of that get unlocked here. Back to this idea of 
like when you can do a brand new thing that you just couldn't do before, that's where really innovative startups are born. So the, the first thing that kind of caught my ear as an investor is this idea that um, you could take data as a new form of an asset and actually start to stake it or, or do liquidity mining with it and bootstrap, you know, a, a new asset class, basically, which is something that everybody has. But I think it's pretty fascinating, the ability to sort of use your data as an asset or you, know, you could use it for collateral, you could, you know, liquidity mine with it and so on. It's pretty fascinating. And yeah, we haven't really seen anybody do that yet, even though, uh, you know, Facebook and Google essentially mine your data and they make 100 to 200 billion dollars a year. So like clearly an aggregate data is quite valuable. Um, you know, if they figure if you figure there are about 2 billion people on the Internet, that means your, your data stream just to Facebook and Google is worth, you know, a hundred dollars a year, um, which is, you know, actually is a sizable amount of money for a lot of people. Um, uh, and, and it's most valuable. I think this is the second interesting uh, insight kind of from an investor perspective that I'll have to think about a little bit is um, it's um, in, in many ways, the asset is the most valuable to the people who have the least money today, which is like, if you're, if you're a millionaire, a hundred dollars may not mean a lot, uh, but if you're in the developing world, $100 is a lot of money. And so it actually um, turns on its head the idea of what a lot of finance or DeFi is doing, which is it's the most valuable for people who have excess assets. And in a lot of ways, data is the most valuable to people who have the least amount of existing assets, which is kind of a novel thing, um, which, which sniffs to me like there are going to be some really interesting startups created kind of on that primitive, like you were saying, because I think it sort of unlocks a different kind of user um, and, and allows you to do things that you couldn't do before. Um, mm. so that's really interesting. No, something I'll have to keep an eye on as, yeah. uh, <laughs> as somebody that invests in startups. Yeah, yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, and, and also, that's why uh, I'm really excited too, like uh, with OASIS platform. Uh, I think that's why it's really uniquely, uh, you know, appealing, appealing and exciting uh, to a lot of developers because of this type of new capabilities and new opportunities that it uh, offers to developers. And, uh, and also another thing going back to a little bit to what you just mentioned, I think another, uh, another um, direction that I'm really excited about that essentially moving this data trust uh, one step further is that, so one point you just made is, right, so like a Facebook, Google, uh, in aggregates, uh, by taking users' data, they create like huge value. But if you distribute that to individuals, each individual may not get a lot of money, like maybe it's a few hundred dollars uh, a year and so on. And one, yes, like for people who don't have much money, that actually is meaningful. Uh, it can be very meaningful. And another thing is that I'm actually hoping that um, by creating this data trust and, uh, uh, and also if you expand it further, it can be this data DAO, right? It's essentially what it allows is, so today, if you look at these aggregators, so basically there are these aggregators, Google and Facebook, they aggregate users' data, and then they basically uh, essentially try to gain benefits on the organizations themselves. So they are separate from users, and they do not represent the best interest of users. But if we can create these data trusts and data DAO that actually represent users, represent users' best interests, now suddenly you have this new entity which is a, 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 a different type of aggregator that because it aggregates potentially lots and lots of users uh, data and so on, it can be very valuable. It can have a lot of power, even more power than you know, each individual maintaining control of their data. And hence, this data DAO, they can actually act on behalf of the user and they can have more negotiation power on behalf of the user. So for example, uh, one, one domain, we haven't spent a lot of time uh, looking into, but I also think it could be a really exciting area to look into is, so for example, people talk about health insurance. In general, it's very difficult for individuals, if you are like, self-employed and so on, you don't have very good options for your health insurance because you are individual. And similarly, there, we see a lot of these kind of examples, just as individuals, it's difficult, like, it's not like you are part of a big company, and then you can have better, and, you know, deals and uh, negotiation power and so on. But this type of data DAO, it can actually aggregate users' data, aggregate users' interests, and then they can negotiate mm -hmm. on behalf of the users. So essentially, they actually, um, they in this case, uh, this data trust or data DAO itself in aggregate can have a lot of value. And this value may not need to be 
distribute it individually to each individual user, that just like hundred hundred dollars a year or something. But when it's in aggregate, it casts a lot of value, and they can provide, for example, better negotiation for better insurance premium. I can offer uh, better uh, just in, 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 you know as a as an insurance term for individuals. So together, individuals help each other. But in this case, because it's a helping users, it's a helping users' uh, it's the best interest, then it actually can uh, essentially, uh, right, I would say it's a new type of player uh, that has not existed before, uh, that potentially can be as powerful as some of the current incumbents, but actually in this case, uh, acting on the uh, on the best interests of uh, users. Yeah, that's really interesting. The idea of a data DAO is also um, it's interesting because kind of back to this idea of aggregating data and making it valuable. And today, what might be a liability sort of getting turned on its head and becoming an asset. I was imagining things like you know you could take everybody that has some rare condition and. Um, it, it might be a liability. They might need some sort of drug, right? And so you know, from an insurer's perspective today, it's considered a liability. But actually, if you can get all of the people in the world who have that condition in one place, and now you can analyze their genomes, and now some pharmaceutical company can make a lot of money off of it because they have everybody's genome in one place, and they can start to understand it and build uh, therapies for it. Um, all of a sudden, the, the aggregate collection of those people actually has a lot of value. Rather than being a, a liability, it becomes an asset to have all that data in one place. Um, such that actually an insurance company or a pharmaceutical company might want to pay for access to that data. Um, so that's, that's pretty fascinating. I, I think those kinds of um, insights where things used to be liabilities and they become assets are, are potentially really powerful, you know, unlocks for value and potentially for businesses as well. Um, that's, that's pretty fascinating. And I think this, I do actually really strongly believe that this is the future, uh, this, uh, the future direction, uh, especially uh, actually as, you know, the world moves more into the digital world and that AI becomes more and more powerful. I think one, we need to have better ways uh, to help users uh, making control of their data and so on. But on the other hand, also, like these technologies become more readily available. And I think the, the, the combination of these uh, technology advancements and so on will make the data now more and more uh, feasible. Uh, and uh, and I think just given uh, essentially the, the development of technology, I think in the end, if as this becomes more and more feasible, and the, and because it aligns better and better with uh, users' interests, and users will demand something more like that, and because it's becoming uh, more and more feasible, then I think this direction. I certainly believe that actually I will win. In the, you know. Yeah, there's a really nice feedback loop there. It is the right architecture to handle sort of this new asset class. And as more and more people come in to take advantage of the ability that you can actually make money off of the data, then it brings more people in. So there's actually a really nice feedback loop there. And it does become, mm -hmm. if you can get it going fast enough, it, it does become sort of the standard way that entire new classes of software should be built. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's, uh, it's a really fun conversation, I think. Uh, uh, we had a lot of really uh, exciting discussions and so on. Yeah, it was great. It was great to see you, Don. Mm -hmm. Pleasure. I learned a bunch, as I always do. Thank you. Great. It's great. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew, and welcome to another video. Uh, today, we're going to talk about Parcel. This is one of the products we have at Oasis. It's a very cool SDK that you can integrate into your product to do all sorts of fun things to protect user privacy, their data, et cetera, et cetera. I'm joined today by Charlie. He's one of the PMs at Oasis Labs. And he's going to provide us an overview of what Parcel is, show you kind of a demo of some fake mock products that we've built, uh, and then we'll provide some information about how you can get started building with Parcel yourself. Um, so Charlie, uh, Maybe you could provide a brief overview of kind of what is Parcel like, why did we build it, and, and what are the kind of values for developers? Cool. Yeah, so Parcel is one of our main tools here at Oasis Labs. Parcel is a set of privacy first data governance APIs. It's designed to give customers great uh, control and oversight of how their data is being used, while also at the same time letting developers continue to build 
great and interesting and valuable products and applications. Uh, mm -hmm. So what it does is Parcel allows developers to securely store sensitive user data, define different usage policies over that sensitive data, share tamper-proof logs with their end users of how their data is being consumed, and then easily deploy different computations and algorithms inside what we call secure computing environments, secure enclaves, so that they can do privacy preserving analysis and generate new data and new insights for their end users. So uh, Parcel, put, putting all that together, that makes it, uh, Parcel makes it really easy for developers to offer their end users great ways to manage their data. We mm -hmm. also have uh, a web UI called Steward App, uh, which allows end users to go in and see in one place uh, the applications that they've granted permission to, the different pieces of data that the applications have accessed on their behalf, manage permissions at any time, see a full access history of how their data is being used by these different apps. Yeah. And you know, what's really, uh, what's really exciting about Parcel uh, is it allows businesses, like I said, to give their users great uh, control over their data and tackle, you know, one of the most, you know, I would say challenging issues uh, of our time in building products today of providing strong privacy guarantees, while also still at the same time being able to build great services, you know, not being not necessarily compromising on the utility of their products. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really challenging trade off. I think a lot of times we think that, um, you know, in order to make things easier to use or in order to provide the utility that we want to provide to our customers, that we'll have to sacrifice on privacy or that they have to at least trust us um, to protect their privacy. And what's really exciting about Parcel is we can kind of remove that trade off in a lot of ways and we can give customers much stronger privacy guarantees um, that are programmatic and really defined and set you know, by the code, by the technology itself. Um, yeah, one, I mean, one really cool use case that I'm excited about is Oasis Labs has partnered with Nebula Genomics. They're, they're kind of like 23andMe, these like direct to consumer genome sequencing companies. Um, but what's different about Nebula is they're really focusing on privacy. And so they've used Parcel to give their customers complete ownership and control of that genome data. So they can manage how it's used. They can log into the Steward app, like you mentioned, and kind of, uh, and, you know, agree to certain usage policies that then Nebula has to adhere to if they want to analyze their data. And Nebula is a fantastic company that, you know, is very privacy focused, but with Parcel, their customers get you know, the strongest guarantees that Nebula is not going to go sell that really valuable data to a pharmaceutical company or to, uh, you know, to other healthcare companies, which is something we've seen other uh, genome sequencing companies do. So yeah, anyway, check, you guys can visit our blog and read about that use case. It's a really cool one. Um, but let's dive into Parcel, uh, kind of look at some demos and uh, kind of learn more about, about how to use this SDK. So uh, Charlie, what are, we gonna, what are we gonna see today in this demo? Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about Nebula also. Our, uh, our demo today won't quite be as cool as uh, privacy first genome sequencing, but okay. hopefully it'll be a really great way. <laughs> hopefully it'll be a really great way for developers to get a sense of all the different building blocks of Parcel and you know hit the ground running, uh, understand how to use it and all the cool things that they wanna build. So what we're gonna do to show that is we're gonna use an example app that we call BlockCred. And so BlockCred is, uh, imagines how you can do uh, credit scoring based on financial data in a way that, like we said, is privacy preserving. Uh, mm -hmm. So the BlockCred app will have sort of three main parts. Uh, we'll have a mock UI for the app that'll allow users to sign up for BlockCred and then link their BlockCred uh, accounts to their Oasis Steward accounts so that mm -hmm. they can manage all their data. The second part of the example will then have us as developers uploading this financial data on behalf of these users. And then the third part is we'll actually run a uh, computation to generate this mock credit score through these secure environments uh, in a privacy preserving way. Super cool. Yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's get started with account linking. Maybe Charlie, you can pull up your screen and we can dive into that. On the top left, we're going to have uh, what our end users will see when they go to use our, our awesome block cred app. On the bottom left here, I've got, of course, my terminal. And on the right side, I've got my code. So like I said, part one here is account linking. So uh, we're in this th the phase of the journey here for our customers of BlockCred, where they've created their BlockCred accounts, they're excited to get started, and they now need to link their accounts to Oasis. So we've got a simple server going here. We've hit the screen in the BlockCred app that says, hey, look, we take data privacy really seriously. We want you to create Oasis Steward accounts so that you can be full owners uh, of your data and see transparently everything that us BlockRed is doing with your data. And so, obviously, this uh, would be like you, you could design this or build it however you wanted it to be, right? I mean, this yeah. is this front end, like in Nebula's use case, this is their kind of existing flow that they already have for sequencing genomes. 
and they've integrated yeah. Parcel into that. Yeah, so uh, I, I am not the, the world's best uh, UI artist here, so this is pretty simple. <laughs> but yeah, you'd imagine this looks like whatever you want your application to look like, and it lives within your onboarding yeah. screens or like perhaps in an account setting screens for users that have already signed up for your app. And so what users will do here is they'll click uh, Get Started with Oasis, and, and that'll dump them off uh, to our app. And so how this works behind the scenes is if we ta switch over to the right side here, we've got uh, the obvious the HTML code behind that landing page. And then if we zoom in here on the last set of lines here, this is really where, where the magic happens. We're kicking off what's called an account linking flow. And so account linking at Oasis is built on top of OAuth 2 and uh, leveraging the OpenID Connect standard, uh, mm -hmm. which is like a simple way to uh, exchange identity information uh, leveraging OAuth 2. So we use an open source library for it. Uh, there's plenty. Of, uh, the one we use is, is up here. You can see it in our public repo of this full example. There's plenty of great OAuth 2 uh, libraries that you can use. And it happens uh, in two main parts. Uh, so the first part here is we create what's called the sign-in request. And that kicks off the first step of the OAuth 2 uh, OpenID Connect flow here. Mm -hmm. And behind the scenes here, if we dig a little bit deeper into the JS code, you'll see the actual configs that we're using. And again, this is all in our repo and in our documentation. So it's, uh, I wouldn't, don't worry too much about the specifics, yeah. but this uses our auth server here. It kicks off what we call the code response type with the scope open ID, uses our client ID that we've registered in uh, the Oasis parcel developer portal, and mm -hmm. then passes in a redirect URL for our, for our local server here. Got it. Um, and, What's, what's key here really is, I would say, the open ID scope, and that's basically saying to Oasis, hey, my application wants access to user's identity address, and mm -hmm. so identity address is a fancy Oasis way of saying a user ID or a user identifier for users in our system, so that you as a developer can link your users in your system to users in our system. Got it. So we've kicked off the first part of the flow here. And so on the left side, let's switch back here. We'll click share. And you see here, like I said, uh, this generates based on that scope. It says BlockCred wants access to your Oasis identity address. And so I'm signing up for BlockCred. I think this is awesome. So I'm going to click share and continue. This redirects back to the BlockCred app. And we hop over here to the callback uh, URL where we process this. And so it happens in two stages. We get back first an access token. And then we exchange that access token for the sorry, the access code, we exchange the access code for the final ID token. It's the ID token that'll then contain that user identity address that I talked about. So Got again, it. we use the OIDC client here to help us process, so it manages a lot of you know the heavy lifting behind the scenes with OF2. We pull out the ID token, we decode it, it's gonna be in a JWT, and then we get back here the ID token. And that's, like I said, it's an identifier for the user. We highly recommend that, you guys, that developers save that to wherever they're keeping track of information about their users so that they can then later on upload data on their behalf, pull data back on their behalf, run computations and know who might be able to map users in their system to users in our system. Got it. And then the last part here of the account linking flows, once you've got the ID address back together and you've linked the accounts is you can then send your users off to our consent or permission screen to then ask for more detailed permissions. And this is where developers specify exactly what their application is going to be doing with different pieces of user data and give users that ability, that, that power to say, this, I, I'm, I'm allowing this, uh, I understand how my data is being used and it's okay with me, so submitting their permissions. So here we see that you know, Acme Co, in order to power the BlockRed app, wants to be able to analyze my bank statements uh, in order to measure my cr credit worthiness if I click yes. Here, I can see the, the consequences of what that means. I'll get back, you know, of course, credit score. And then if I say no, uh, I, I know I won't be able to get a credit score. So this sounds great. I want to be able to use this app. So I'll say yes, and I'll hit confirm. Yeah, what I really like about this, like beyond just the, the kind of like programmatic guarantees that we're behinding, providing underneath the hood, you also can provide some really nice, like clean language to explain to the user what you're doing. You don't necessarily have to hide. Of course, you could like also link to some legalese or something like that. But this is a really nice format to to make some kind of condensed, abbreviated um, permission structure that your users can then use. Um, uh, totally, they really can understand how you're using your data. Yeah. 
exactly. And, and that's, that's, what, that's what we think is so great about Parcel is it makes it really easy for developers to be that clear and transparent with their users with hopefully not a lot of work. Yeah, exactly. Click here and finish onboarding. It takes us back to the Blockcrate app. And then we see here just for completeness that we have been able to link our user account. So this is what we call the Oasis identity address or an Oasis user identifier here that the Blockcrate app then gets back uh, on my behalf. That's important because we're then going to use that in the next two steps of our demo here. So step number two of the demo, like I talked about, is being able to upload data uh, mm -hmm. on behalf of users. And so the piece of data that we'll upload, uh, I'll pull it up here so you guys can see, is uh, bank data, financial data that we'll use to run the credit score. So using a very simplified example here, we've got an array of balance uh, values over time. So these are the different, uh, these are the values in this user's bank account over the last few days. We have the hard code here, and we're gonna upload it from the command line, but you can imagine that in practice, you might perhaps be pulling this from a different API, perhaps you've integrated with Plaid to pull it from their bank account, or you're integrated directly with uh, a financial institution's APIs. And then this is all happening in, you know, in, in reality, probably in a Lambda or Google Cloud function or in you know, an express server that you're running. Uh, and you're pulling in the Oasis SDK uh, on the fly as you're pulling in this data to then store it back to Oasis. So what do we do with this? We then, we upload it. So it should be pretty simple, like I said, we want to make this really easy for developers to be great uh, stewards of their users' data. So if we hop over here, uh, we're gonna pull in, in order to do that, we're gonna use the parcel SDK. So it's a bunch mm -hmm. of you know, APIs and wrappers that we've created in TypeScript to, again, make it really easy and abstract away a lot of the complexity of working with uh, our network and our products so developers can, you know, build great apps really easily. So it should be really as simple as we pull in the SDK, we use our developer credentials, which is a client ID and key pair that you uh, register in the portal, mm -hmm. in our developer portal, and then we build out the actual data set. So we give it a title, we give it some metadata so we're able to find it later and then we read in the actual data. So we'll read it in from that file, we'll pass in that metadata, and we'll say here, and I think this is a, the, the key line to call out is that this piece of data belongs to our end users. So we're gonna use that identity address that we got from part yeah. one, and we're gonna say this data set of bank records belongs to this user, uh, and we're gonna mark ourselves as, as the application, as the developer, uh, as the creator of this. That, that then creates you know, the relationship there, saying you know, the Blockcred app and mm -hmm. this user are collaborating over this piece of data. And if it succeeds, we should see back, uh, I'm gonna kick it off over here, we should see back in the terminal um, a address for the data set. And I'll explain in just a second what that means. So let me set, start this off here. I'll take off the upload script. Oops. I'm gonna make sure I copy in the user identity. I'm gonna copy it here, but you'd imagine uh, you could also pull it in programmatically as you've completed user linking and I'm gonna start uh, uploading the data set. And like I said, if this succeeds, you'll get back what we call an address for the data set. So we have an address for our user and we have an address for our data set. And this represents where on our blockchain these different entities live. Yeah. And so we see it succeeded. That was, that was super quick, that's awesome. And so now we have here this address uh, for the data set. And so how do I know, like, I mean, maybe a silly question, but um, how do I know that like the policies that the user opted into are applied to that data set? Like how, how, what's the relationship between those policies, the user and the data sets themselves? Yeah, it's a great question. So it, as the user's coming in here and they're seeing these permissions and they say yes or no, what we're doing behind the scenes for developers is we're managing a set of what we call policies to, to say that this developer is allowed to access these pieces of data that belong to these users. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we do that all to sort of abstract away a lot of the complexity and there's, there's several different ways that you can verify that you have permission. You can just try and go in as a developer and try to access the data set and if yeah. you have permission, it'll succeed. And if it doesn't, it'll throw you an error. So you can sort of just like leave, leave the policy manager to us and just use it as is. And we'll sort of, it'll work and not work and automatically based on the user's preferences. You can also use some of our APIs and our command line tools to go. If you, if you're curious or like it's important to the logic of your app, you can actually go in look at a data set, look at the policy on the data set, look at the state of those policies, see which different entities the policies facilitate relationships with. So you can see, you know, programmatically or in your command line or on the fly, see the different states of different data sets and whatnot. You can also 
Uh, if it's easier, you can go into our developer facing UI and see all the different data sets that have been granted, uh, granted your app permission. Got it, very cool. Cool, so we've granted permission. Uh, I'm in here back here in the steward app as the end user so we can see that the actual data set has uploaded successfully. Uh, we can double check and, and make sure it looks like what we'd expect. So I'm here, in, like I said, in the app as the end user, I've hit download on the data set. And if I take a peek at it, uh, we'll see the data and that matches what we had, you know, over in the code, what we thought we were uploading. So now we know the data is uploaded, uh, it's on the chain. We've got these access policies, again, mediated through the chain with an immutable ledger so that we know exactly what's happening. Nothing, you can't muck with anything, can't, can't do any funny business. No funny business, I like it. <laughs> so the la last, last bit of uh, the demo here, uh, rounded out is the exciting part. We're gonna actually generate the credit score. So we're gonna take in this data set as an input. We're gonna run a simple algorithm and decide, you know, what's credit score to apply to this user. Like I said, it's all gonna happen in our secure computing environment, yeah. uh, which, you know, encrypts the, the data, uh, you know, stays encrypted within you. It's memory that stays encrypted within use so that it, uh, we as a developer never actually see or take ownership of the end user data completely respecting, you know, their privacy, uh, but are still able to, you know, run algorithms and generate r valuable information. Yeah. Yeah, what's neat about this, I mean, is basically you can have an end-to-end -end flow where, you know, I can build an app and my system never sees or really even touches the raw data. You know, I'm loading it into an encrypted computer, a secure computing environment. I'm pulling it in from, you know, Plaid or some other API and just piping it directly into the Oasis system. So I'm building a whole system where I have all the benefits of being able to use this data, but you know, never, never have to have the risk necessarily of storing it in my own system. Totally, and hopefully it's really easy to do, right? Like it was a couple yeah. lines of code, upload it, and now I'm gonna show you a couple lines of code here to actually run the algorithm. So really powerful, but uh, still really accessible and easy to use. So we're gonna run the report, again, pull in the SDK here. We're gonna use the user identity address and now also the address of that data set that we uploaded. And the way this works, is um, we have a program and this program here is gonna be a simple bash script, but it can get as complex as pulling in a Docker image, pulling in a machine learning model that you've trained, yeah. pulling in a Python script that you're using. It's super flexible. You can specify, use our default image for the worker. You can specify your own Docker images, run all sorts of really powerful uh, programs within this worker. And so I'll pull up the, uh, the script here so we get a sense of what this algorithm looks like. It's it's super simple, just so that it's easy to track here in the demo. We're gonna take in as input those records that we talked about, and then we're gonna generate an output, which is the credit score. And the way we do it here uh, in our super intelligent, super advanced uh, credit scoring application is we calculate an average of your balance. And if your average balance in your bank account is over this value, uh, we're gonna assign you a credit score of 722. And if it's below the 1250 threshold, we're gonna give you a credit score of 684. I mean, this is how all credit score apps work, right? So <laughs> this is how the sausage is made. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, like I said, we're going to use that bash script and then actually kicking off the job with our SDK should be really simple. So we're going to take in that bash script. We're going to upload it as an input, a program, so we can use it. And then we're going to uh, build out here uh, our command line invocation of that script. And so we're going to say uh, we're going to use that bash script and then we're going to pass into it as an input uh, that records uh, data set and then we're gonna say we're writing an output and we we configure this together here by for the records data set we're saying that's that we, we want to use that as an input for our job and we're pulling that in from the chain so here's the address of that data set we want to use as input and then we're also specifying here that our our job creates one output and we're going to store that output at score.txt and so behind the scenes what's happening is our worker is going to create an empty file and it's going to place that file within the, in, in this environment here so that the script can write their outputs to that file. And then when it's all said and done, the worker is going to come through and take that output and turn it into a new parcel data set automatically for us. And we can specify some configurations around that output. Uh, specifically here, what we're going to say is our end user is going to also be the owner of that out output set. So to your point, right, full end-to-end -end ownership of data by our end users. We're gonna take our, uh, use what's called the dispatcher. We're gonna submit a request for the job. And then the dispatcher is gonna let us know, uh, it's gonna find a worker, submit the job into that you know, secure computing environment. It's gonna wait and the dispatcher is gonna be the thing that tells us, hey, this job is completed. It has either succeeded or failed. And if it succeeds, which hopefully, you know, knock on wood, it will, 
uh, it'll create output data sets and the dispatcher will let us know, hey, now you have these new data sets that are created by your job and they live at these new addresses on the chain. So hopefully relatively straightforward, yeah, but also cool. super flexible. So let's hop over here to the command line and let's run our job. So we're gonna uh, use our report script here. We're gonna pass in again, the user identity address that owned that piece of data. And then we're gonna pass in that data, the address for that data set that we had previously uploaded. And that's our records data set, which has our bank records, uh, the input for the job. And so I'm gonna run this. And so what's happening behind the scenes is that I've used my uh, TypeScript code over here to request the job. It's gone off to the dispatcher. The dispatcher has taken in our different request parameters and then the dispatcher is going to then dispatch that job to an available worker. The work will take in the input data sets into our secure computing environments, decrypt them within the secure environment, bring in our program, run our analysis, and then generate our output data set. It'll take that output file, turn it into a parcel data set, and upload it to parcel. At that point, it'll get encrypted, and only that encrypted piece of output, that output data set, will be the thing that leaves the secure computing environment. We've also specified that our end user is going to be the owner of that data set, so it will still belong to them. They'll hold the keys that encrypted data set. So end to end, from beginning to end, from bank records to credit score, our user maintains full ownership of all of their data that's happened and generated through the block credit app. And so yeah, on the left hand side here. Yeah, sorry, one thing yeah. I'll add to you, what's really cool about this is like from an application developer standpoint, I don't have to necessarily take on a central risk of handling the sensitive data. You know, I can build a system that essentially keeps it private or keeps it encrypted um, throughout every step of the flow. Um, so it's a, it's a really neat way of not only providing better privacy to your customers, but also you know, potentially helping protect yourself as you're, as you're building some apps. Totally, yeah. I, we think there's incredible value for both sides, developers and their, and their customers. And so the dispatcher here has told us that this job with this ID has completed nice. successfully. It's created an output. And so if we hop back up here to Steward app as our end user, we should now actually see the output of that job as a new data set. So I'm gonna kick off a download of that so we can check and see what our credit score is. And we should also be able to go over here to the data history tab. And if I refresh that, we should see here a log that Blockhead Acme Co used my bank record data to generate this uh, credit scoring uh, result. And then also I see, of course, a record here that I as the end user downloaded my record. So it's downloaded. Let me open that up here and boom, we got a 722 credit score. Nice credit score, Charlie. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a diligent saver. <laughs> yeah, this is, this is very cool. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a powerful flow because it, it gives the user kind of the total insight and total control of how their data is being used. Um, in a way that's really transparent. Of course, obviously, here the user's downloading this file, but with you know additional permissions and kind of the right setup, you could also uh, surface this information within your own app so the user was was able to consume it or view it there, that kind of thing. Totally. Um, cool, Charlie, so this is really exciting. Um, it's cool to see Parcel in action. Uh, where should folks go if they want to get started using Parcel? Like, what are the next steps? How, do, how should they get started? Yeah, uh, I, we hope folks see this and they're really excited and want to start building with Parcel. If you want to get building with Parcel, visit our website, oasislabs.com slash Parcel SDK. There's a form there. Fill out the form with your info, and then we'll be in touch. We'll get you set up with our NPM package. We'll get you set up with our documentation, and we'll you know help you hit the ground running and start building with Parcel. Yeah, we've got all those links in the comment section, so um, you can check them out down there. And we're excited to see what you all build. So talk to you soon.
At the Music Fund, we provide automated financing for artists. We do this by allowing artists to sell a portion of their streaming royalties, and we offer many artist-friendly features. As part of the application process, artists need to provide their credentials to their distributor. That's because many of the services do not provide OAuth or APIs. So that artists can keep control of their own data, we use Oasis's privacy-preserving blockchain to store the credentials. And we also use Oasis's Steward app so that artists have complete visibility into how we are using their data and they can revoke our access at any time. We see this use of Oasis as just the beginning, and we're excited about the possibility in the future of using it in other ways, so that artists can maintain control of their own data and share it with whoever they want. All right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Andrew, I'm from the Oasis team, and welcome to a video about pair times. So as you guys know, the Oasis network has this unique architecture where we separate consensus from compute. Uh, we call this the pair time architecture. And that compute layer is made up of separate uh, pair times or parallel runtimes. These are essentially unique compute environments uh, with a set of nodes that can be designed and tailored for a broad set of use cases. Uh, today, we're joined by Second State. They're a partner of Oasis, a close friend of ours, and they're building um, a really exciting paradigm on the Oasis network. Uh, so I'm joined by Michael. So Michael, maybe you can tell us a little bit about Second State. What is it? Uh, what do you guys do beyond just Oasis? And then, you know, dive into this unique paradigm that you're building for the Oasis network. All right. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Hi, everybody. Um, uh, this is Michael Yuanto. As you can see, this is um, uh, this is my home office in Austin, Texas. That's where <laughs> we are located. Uh, the and life of COVID, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we have to see everybody's office. You can see my telescope there, right? <laughs> yeah. So, well, yeah. So, um, uh, Second State is a company that does uh, what we call a high performance runtimes. You know, so we do things like virtual machine compilers mm -hmm. and uh, WebAssembly and all that. So we were um, super excited when we heard about um, the Oasis network because that uh, seems to be, um, you know, uh, outside of cloud computing. For in our other business, we work with cloud providers, right? You know, uh, like uh, Tencent Cloud in China and Amazon here and Azure here, you know, so, um, in, in the U.S. But Oasis seems to provide uh, a brand new type of runtime architecture that allows um, uh, us to integrate our uh, virtual machine and uh, into a blockchain setting. Uh, not only it's secure, but also it's uh, seem to provide um, confidentiality and privacy. So that's uh, what's originally got us super excited about that. And so um, we decided, you know, with the help from the uh, with the Oasis Foundation, we decided to build a paradigm that's uh, that would take advantage of the infrastructure Oasis the Oasis team has built. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, so the paradigm that we build and we're launching today is. Uh, Called um, the Oasis Ethereum paradigm, and it's a uh, it's a Ethereum compatible um, runtime on the Oasis network. So that's that's what we do. <laughs> Very cool. So so tell us a little bit about um, this Ethereum compatible runtime. Like, what is it? Like, how does it compare to Ethereum? Uh, you know, is it is it basically the same thing, or really kind of what what makes it different? That's that's a great question. Thank you, Andrew. So um, well, you know. So one of the things that we, we realized early on is that um, uh, Oasis has some really unique features, like it has a new consensus mechanism, it's privacy first and all that. Um, however, if you look at, uh, if we look at the you know, blockchain application and the blockchain developers, where they are, it's, um, I think it's safe to say that um, you know, the vast majority of them are using the Ethereum protocol. You know, they use mm -hmm. developer tools. That that community has developed and they're using um, programming languages and has a lot of software that's already in existence that in the Ethereum ecosystem. So we thought it's uh, uh, it's probably a good idea to um, to uh, to meet those developers out there instead of to say we come up with everything our own and you know you have to learn that's the new stuff that comes to us. Yeah, so that's uh, yeah. 
it almost never works that way, right? You know, so so you know, it it, it it's the same idea as Amazon Web Services adopted Node.js and the Java. They didn't invent their own language. So you know, that's uh, so that's the idea that that we want to do is to uh, um, is to allow it's easy for Ethereum developers to move their code and also to move their asset to the new blockchain, and then to um, and the new blockchain would also be able to interoperate with the with the existing uh, Ethereum blockchain and even Ethereum uh, Ethereum 2.0. So that's um, we think that's build a um, bigger ecosystem and allows different type of application to live on different ecosystems. So Got that's uh, so um, maybe I can share my screen yeah. to, sh uh, to show you a, a little bit more of uh, what uh, uh, Oasis Ethereum uh, Paradigm does. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that's interesting. So so essentially, you know you're thinking is why reinvent the wheel? Folks are already using all these great tools on the Ethereum side of things. We can essentially replicate that environment using this unique paradigm architecture on the Oasis network. Yes, it's, uh, the idea really is to uh, bring the advantage of Oasis to Ethereum, right? Mm -hmm. You know, is that so that people can um, be, say, you know, one of the things that we did is that we ported some of DeFi applications to Oasis yeah. through, the, through the paradigm, right? You know. Um, if you have heard, you know, there's a, um, you know, uh, people have compared, you know, this DeFi landscape with Dark Forest, right? You know, is that, <laughs> um, you know, the Dark Forest is a sci-fi term in terms, you know, that's, um, you know, you try to explain why exterior store life, we have never find exterior store lives. It's because, yeah, yeah. you know, when, whenever people find us, they're going to kill us first because, you know, they're going to eliminate all the civilization in the world. It's the same thing on blockchain, DeFi ecosystem, right? <laughs> that, Whenever you have a transaction that's potentially pro uh, profitable and you send the transaction to the mempool, uh, other people are going to be able to see it first. And then most likely the, the, robot, the advanced robot are going to be able to see it first. They're going to yeah. get ahead of you and execute the transaction on their own first. So, you know, that's what they call, um, you know, dark forest is that you can always get front run on the yeah. ecosystem. Yeah. You know, front running financial systems is illegal. In the traditional, um, it has been illegal for like hundred years for good reason, you know, precisely okay. because of that. But um, on the on the blocking ecosystem, it's um, it, it, it's rampant, right? You know, that's uh, that's one of the things that uh, privacy really matters in in this ecosystem is that I need a way to protect my transaction until after it's being executed, right? You know, yeah. that's, uh, yeah. So and while still. Uh, make sure that it's uh, uh, it's trustworthy, it's, uh, it's validity. You know, it's that um, you know everyone would be able to t attest that this is a legal transaction, and they, they just don't know what's inside it, right? You know, so that that's um, that that's one of the huge reasons that we saw. You know, that's um, you know um, um, the, the the Ethereum application developers would need that. They would need uh, say, of course, they can use Uniswap, and on Ethereum, it's provide a lot of liquidity. But for truly um, uh, confidential transactions, they, they should come to, um, you know, uh, um, I think uh, perhaps another blockchain that can interoperate with Ethereum so that both yeah. code and uh, asset can move freely in both ways. So that's all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. So why don't you share your screen and then we can we can dive into confidential smart contracts a little bit more and talk about those. Um, all right then. Okay. So here's a here's a the website that we built for for this particular runtime, you know, so um, you, know, you can, the domain is easy to remember. It's called oasseast.org, right? Oasis <laughs> right? <laughs> so, So, um, and the um, you can see see the icon is also, you know, it's basically a serum icon, but with a fingerprint, you know, so it's a confidential smart contract, right? You know, it's taking advantage of Oasis confidential uh, confidentiality and privacy computing features and applied to Ethereum. Yeah, I so, like nice. Yeah. So um, I want to play you the video. If you want to see the video, you can watch it. It's just a demonstration of how, you do, uh, how Uniswap works on our, um, you know, our runtime. It's one of the most complex mm -hmm. uh, digital applications. So, so, you, uh, so you can see how it works. And, uh, you know, there's uh, features of it. You know, if we go, go through the website, there's several key features. First, like we said, it's compatible with Ethereum. It's a super important thing. Mm -hmm. is to um, you know create a bridge for the both ecosystems, and uh, it's uh, um, it supports confidential smart contracts. That's something we also did discuss a little, and then because of the unique consensus mechanism of OSS, it's also provide high performance. 
Meaning, um, you know, one of the things about Ethereum POW, the current Ethereum chain, is that you know it takes a lot of energy. You know, it's very, it's somewhat inefficient, and also as a node operator, you need to um, uh, synchronize from Genesis. So it's a very long process to um, to 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 create a, a full Ethereum node. You know, it's um, you know I've done multiple times. It's it takes about a week, you know, just to just to, to sync it up, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. but with the OSS mechanism that you can have checkpoints, you can have you can have a lot of those you know, nice, uh, you know, new blockchain features that will allow you to set up very quickly and uh, mm -hmm. consume considerable less computational resources. And as a result, it's much faster for developers, you know, so, and the gas fee is a lot slower. So uh, that thing is um, because, um, Andrew, as you, as you have said, we are one of the paradigms. There could be other paradigms on uh, Oasis ecosystem. So there's other specialized blockchains that we can interact with. You know, mm -hmm. for instance, I, I know Oasis has already done a lot of work in, you know, in things like healthcare and in all those things, right? You know, yeah. so for those uh, applications and, uh, you know, uh, their data can, can pass over to our paradigm you mm -hmm. know, in the same ecosystem. So that's um, where we also see that we're acting as a bridge to basically have the best of both worlds, right? <laughs> you know, that's, uh, uh, you know, so at least that's, that's our hope, you know. So that's yeah. what it is. And then there's a token that's, uh, you know, because well, we are in the East uh, space, so so there's a token that you have to pay gas, and you can get it for free now. You know, there's a faucet that developers can get it for free. And uh, there's, um, um, and, and we have some social groups that you can join. And one of the things that we have done is to have a full port of unit swap on the OSSDs just to demonstrate to us and also to the community, it works. Yeah. So, cool. so you know, there's uh, um, um, I, I believe the team from our our, our team will, um, will give you a demonstration of you know how Uniswap works, mm -hmm. our platform, and how can trade stuff. So you know that's um, so we wouldn't get into this part now, and we would get this part perhaps later in this um, in in this conversation is how developers can start to interact with um, the, the the paradigm. Of course, all the Ethereum tools. You, uh, still works. All the wallets, MetaMask and the Remix, and the, the Brave browser. You know, all those Ethereum tools work. And uh, uh, we, w um, but we also have our own tools that would make it a little bit easier for developers to um, to to do uh, smart contract and DApps. So that's what it is. So we have done a lot of um, work. You know, both in the runtime and in the tools. So, you know, I hope um, um, you know um, people will enjoy it and be able to use it. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Exciting to see the website and to kind of see everything up and running. This is this is great. Really exciting. So so folks are are able to use this right now, right? So if they want to test things out, they can visit oasisdeep.org um, and they can they can uh, start developing and porting their their Ethereum apps over to the Oasis network um, yeah. and to your pair time. Yeah, that's great. So so we chatted a little bit about confidentiality and kind of what makes um, that unique. So. You know, do you want to talk a little bit more about confidential smart contracts, kind of how those work, and then what the plan is for Second State and their support for confidentiality? Yeah, so um, for that, I would point you to one of the um, the paper on our website. It's up in front, it's front and center. So it's called uh, mm -hmm. Confidential Ethereum Smart Contracts. And if you have time, you can read it. But, you know, uh, um, but one of the core ideas is, you know, uh, we protect uh, smart contract using Oasis infrastructure. We protect smart contracts in two ways. One is when it's broadcast, you know, when it's so it does not broadcast the transactions in the open. Mm -hmm. It's uh, all because all the node runs inside uh, trusted execution environments, which is a right. hardware feature that a lot of CPUs provide, right? You know, so um, so all the broadcast is actually encrypted for that for for those particular nodes. So. Even the node operators themselves cannot see it, you know, because it's in encoded in the hardware. It's like, um, you know, your fingerprint in the iPhone, right? It's it's in a security enclave. Yeah. So even if someone has physical possession of your iPhone and we have to unlock it, it still wouldn't be able to see your fingerprint. You know, mm -hmm. it's, uh, um, however, they can use your fingerprint to sign transactions and, and do things like that. So that's one layer of security is to say, when the transaction is being broadcasted, unlike traditional Ethereum, we do it in a way that is totally encrypted. And mm -hmm. the second is to protect data inside smart contracts. So for instance, today, um, if you run a Ethereum 4 node, you would be able to look into the database. You would be able to look into the blockchain itself and see what's inside those smart contracts, what are the variables, what are the, you know, things like that, who did what, yeah. who, you know. Um, so for this, um, you know, 
we do a little change to the Solidity language, the smart contract language itself. So there's a, a small piece of code on the screen, if you can see it, you know, is that it's to say in the smart contract, we introduce a new keyword called confidential. And at, as I said earlier, you know, our second state is most uh, a runtime and a compiler company. So we build this whole tool chain, right? You know, so we, we change the, the, um, the Solidity compiler a little bit to, to uh, support this new keyword. And yeah. once this keyword is um, is present in the smart contract, the runtime knows that all the data that's in here would only be handled inside the the security enclave, the hardware enclave. Yeah. Once it goes out of the hardware enclave, it's always encrypted. So again, even the node operator, let alone anyone else, would not be able to see what's inside the contract. You know, you can have certain fields in the contract that is um, that is completely confidential. Yet um, Every node can also agree on what's in it. You know, it's just the human doesn't know. All the computers, the way to look at it is all the computers knows what's in there, but the non-human knows. You know, yeah. it's a, you know, because this private key is inside the hardware and the computer knows, but the yeah. human. Well, even only certain parts of the computers know, which is easy. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah that's neat. And, and, and I mean, you mentioned it before, but I mean, at Oasis, we're really excited about the, the application of this technology in DeFi, whether it's front running or, or offering kind of other interesting use cases. Uh, we think confidential smart contracts have a lot of potential to help uh, help grow DeFi and really the blockchain space in general by, by providing these properties that I think in, uh, you know, that I think in, in a centralized world, we kind of take for granted. We're like, oh yeah, I trust Amazon, so I'm, I'm fine uh, running it this way. But in a decentralized world, confidentiality really becomes critical. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, great. So um, so what's next? What do you want to show us next? We could we could chat about eWASM or we can dive into the developer experience. Oh, yeah. So um, perhaps a word or two on, on eWASM. So, so one of the interesting things that Second State does is, um, is uh, we not only support um, you know, the current generation of EVM, but we also support the next generation of EVM. Mm -hmm. And we know Ethereum 2.0 is coming along. It's uh, currently going through the the, the, uh, the consensus work, right? But mm -hmm. in the end, you know, they would also need a new virtual machine that have been talked about a lot for, for a very long time. And this virtual machine would be WebAssembly based. And why would WebAssembly based? You know, it's precisely what you see on this screen, right? You know, is that, um, you know, what if someone wants to change something? In the current EVM architecture, it's, everything is tightly coupled. You know, that's a, yeah. a programming term, right? So it's difficult to change. But with WebAssembly as open standard, we wouldn't be able to change that. We wouldn't be able to have plugins and, you know, things like that. So um, it's the EVASM virtual machine that allows us to do that. And uh, um, EVASM is aiming to be backward compatible with, uh, with the EVM at the source code level. So if you write contract in Solidity, you will be able to compile it to, to today's EVM and, tomorrow, and, and EVASM. So EVASM is one of, um, is, um, is one of the, um, I wouldn't say unique feature because the standard is defined by the Ethereum Foundation. But okay. um, Second State is one of the only companies that has a working EVASM implementation, and we also have the EVASM compiler. So those are the things that's um, you know that's um, we do, and 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 through the, the the OSS collaboration, we we would also like to bring this type of innovation to the Ethereum developer community, so that today's Ethereum developers would be able to uh, do you know. It's, Experience tomorrow today, right? <laughs> you know, and uh, you know that's uh, and and the deploy that application on the OSS uh, on the OSS blockchain as well. So that's uh, you know, so that's that's another feature that we want. So um, perhaps we we could move on to to show a demonstration to to show how easy it is, you know, to um, to have a um, to develop and de deploy application on the OSS Ethereum runtime. Is that, is that okay? Yeah. yeah, let's do it. That sounds great. Okay. All right. Then. Yeah. I mean, we're at Oasis, we're big fans of Wasm. So we're excited to see this coming to Ethereum and excited to see second state, uh, you know, looking to support it. So that, that's, that's exciting news. Yeah. That's, um, Wasm is so hot, right? You know, that's, <laughs> uh, you know, yeah, that's, yeah, it's a great community as well. Uh, we've, uh, we've hosted some Wasm meetups as well, and Oasis uh, Oasis Labs has, has done quite a bit of work on on looking into Wasm and Wasi and how it applies to blockchain. So it's it's an exciting space, yeah. Definitely. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's uh, um, it'll it's also an excellent community to be in because I think all the next generation blockchains are based on Wasm these days, right? Mm -hmm. You know, 
yeah. U.S., polka dots, OSS, you know, those, um, you know, any German stuff. <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, it's a good space. Um, it, it's a good skill to learn. I mean, if you're a developer watching this, I would say, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's like Java in 1998. <laughs> like, you know, that's, uh, you know, learn it. <laughs> so um, let's look at what the developer experience look like. So go to that website, oasis.org, and then, you know, uh, go to the developer tab. It, it shows you the three steps to, to write, deploy, publish your own, what we call decentralized application, which consists of a smart contract on the back end and your HTML JavaScript on the front end. And we, you know, all this takes less than five minutes, I will show you. And so first is to open our web ID. Um, this is the ID that we created, but you know, that's, you don't have to use that. You know, you can use um, Ethereum tools like Remix or um, the, I think there's a um, Ethereum Solidity Studio on, on Ethereum Foundation website as well. So you can use all of that. And just to um, point the RPC node, it's RPC settings to the OSS Ethereum uh, RPC node, which um, you know, we described in uh, uh, on this web page. But to use our web ID is probably the easiest way to get started because that's have everything set up already. Okay. So you open this and uh, sorry, it's you should see this contract and it has the RPC node set up already and all that. So that's that's all good. And if you look at this solidated contract, it's very easy. You know, it's a it's a smart contract that only has a set and get, you know, you set a number and you get a number. And the number is stored on the blockchain, right? You know, that's yeah. If you do that, so you say compile. There's a, uh, in fact, this com um, you know this this compile compiling does in, inside the web browser, so it compiles into the you know Ethereum the bytecode, the Ethereum bytecode. And now you say deploy to the block to the chain because now you compile it, you can deploy it to the chain. Oh, I. I'll show you a fair case first because it says success, right? You know, um, because <laughs> it always works, right? <laughs> right. You know, that's uh, not supposed to work. Why are you doing you know, so? It's uh, um, it's because you know um, the the uh, IDE gave you a number of addresses that you can uh, sign and deploy this from, and because I've already used this before, so I have an address that has tokens in it. But yeah. um, when you start, you would have an address that doesn't have a token. Okay. So this would fail. You know, that's uh, um, you would say it is uh, the the address doesn't have you know um, uh, a token in it to pay for gas. Yeah. And what you do is that you go to the um, is you go to the web page again, and then you go to the faucet for uh, gas faucet for dev, and it would give you um, a page like this. Mm -hmm. Hold on. a page like this. So you know you would put your address here, and um, you know you. Do, it takes a block, you know, it takes about six to seven, 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. And it, it'll give you some gas. This is one OES because ES is like one followed by 18 zeros. So that's, uh, you know, it sounds like a lot, but it's not a lot. So it give you one ES, you know, that's, uh, that would show up on, show up here on, on, uh, on your account. So you take one of the account address and uh, to give it one ES. But since I've already done this, so it, uh, so it shows up as success. And then now the block, now the smart contract is already successful. It's successfully deployed, and uh, you can, you can actually see it here. You know, you can click open, and you can actually interact with it. You can say, I want to get the number. The number is zero because I haven't said anything. I can okay. say, I want to change the number to forty-two. Transact, and it would say success again. And if I do get, it now says forty-two. You guys see that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's what it took. So now you can interact with the smart contract, but the other people can interact with, your users can interact with, you know, they have to do the Ethereum transaction and all that. It's, it's better to have a user interface on top of it. What's the, so you switch to the DAP tab, the decentralized application tab. So it has three things, HTML, CSS, Very and cool. JavaScript. Yeah. The important thing is really JavaScript. The JavaScript use Web3 to call the smart contract. Mm -hmm. It has everything pre-populated for you. The, 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 the data you have just compiled is pre-populated for you. So we don't make any changes here. We just to say we want to run it. It runs here. It says has set data and get data. If you say get data, it shows 42, right? It goes to the, actually goes to the blockchain and look into the smart contract and get, to, get you the number. 
And you can also set the data. You can set the data to say 314. Okay. And uh, it shows up, you know, it's emitted a JavaScript event which you can capture in your UI, but it says success. And you go to get it again. Mm -hmm. It says 314. So that's it. You know, that's. Uh, yeah, um, Michael, just to say, I think your, your get data and set data maybe are popping up in a window that's not in the presentation. So that's well. oh. it, it's fine. Yeah, I okay. think we, we get the gist of it, though. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, but that's very cool. Yeah, it, it's, I, I, you know, it's amazing that you can just do all the DAP development, you know, in this nice, uh, through, via this nice interface. Yeah, you know, that's, um, um, you, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible. So we will probably have a, a hackathon at some point, you know, that's to, to yeah. That people write something, you know, it's if you look at this, it's no different than cloud computing, you're right? You know, it's uh, I have a backend, the backend is called smart contract, that's your function as a service or your, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, that's uh, and you have a front end which is JavaScript, right? And with Oasis, you can have confidentiality in the back end, you know, that's um, you know, if you have a function as a service deployed on a cloud provider, you know, the cloud provider can always see it, but here, you know, that's um, you you would have it fully decentralized and trustworthy and uh. You know, people wouldn't be able to see, you know, to see what's inside it, right? You know, so that's a, um, so that so that's an advantage of, you know, um, I think the the, the Oasis network that that brings to developers. So I thought that's uh, very cool. Yeah. Yeah, and we're we're really excited about this. Um, I mean, I think it's going to be really the first opportunity to folks for folks to get their hands on the Oasis network to uh, to play around to write DApps and to, to deploy some some you know interesting DApps on uh, you know via your your pair of time so really excited thanks for showing us Michael uh, as you kind of alluded to um, in the coming weeks we're going to announce uh, you know a little bit of a joint kind of hackathon project where folks can earn some rewards um, for completing tasks on the second state uh, pair of time development environment um, you know we're also going to give rewards for things like uh, you know, the most exciting DAP that's most interesting DAP that's deployed, uh, that kind of stuff. So, so stay tuned for that. Um, follow us on Twitter, follow Oasis Protocol on Twitter, or follow our Telegram, uh, and we'll be announcing uh, some more information in those channels. Um, but in the, in the meantime, uh, thanks, Michael. Appreciate you coming on and, and chatting with me. This was, uh, it was really cool to see the, the whole experience. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Great. All right. Bye, everyone. Hi there, it's Tim from Second State. Today I'm gonna to do a quick video on how to deploy an ERC20 contract onto the Oasis um, mainnet beta. And we're gonna be using uh, some Second State infrastructure, which is this build tool, where we can uh, compile and deploy contracts. The contracts will be deployed to the Oasis mainnet beta, uh, where we have a faucet over here to grab some free uh, tokens to do all of this work. Now this is uh, one of the objectives of the Oasis Hackathon. So I'm just doing a very informal video just to show you, just give a bit of a head start and some bit of information about how to pull all these tools together and um, create this. So let's get started. Okay, so first things first, we have the build tool. This is a great tool built by Second State where you can paste in the uh, Solidity smart contract code and you can click compile and you can deploy this. Now, a couple of things. So we have a contract name down here. So I will make this say uh, Tim 10 token and we'll call, so the token name, which is actually deployed is Tim 10 and then the symbol for this, we'll make it Tim 10. Okay, now the way this particular contract that's referenced in the uh, Oasis Hackathon is that it has a constructor that's explicit here. So we, we need to make sure that this Tim 10 contract name is the same as the constructor's name. If those two aren't the same, then the constructor won't fire. And obviously um, you can also write your Solidity code to just say the word constructor as opposed to explicitly um, having the same contract name and constructor name. But uh, that's okay, so that'll all work. Now, just a bit of a background on this build tool. The section down here, if you're clicking on the links through from the instructions from Second State and Oasis to um, you know, participate in this hackathon, you'll, you'll see that all this is already filled out. So this build tool is already connected to the o Oasis mainnet beta, um, the chain ID is 69, and that's the RPC URL. And we've also got some custom gas and stuff 
put in there for you already. Uh, the section that's fairly important is this accounts section. So when you open the build tool, it'll always generate for you like five accounts um, automatically. And you can just go ahead and use those accounts. But because we're going to be actually uh, heading over to um, using like a MetaMask wallet and also the Uniswap exchange that's been deployed on the Oasis mainnet beta. So what we want to do is actually generate a fresh account. So if you go and open up MetaMask and you go create account and then you give that an account name, just leave that as account eight. When you create that, you can then go into account details here and there's a section that says export private key. So when you put your password in there, um, it'll actually show you your private key. And what you can do then is, of course, never share that with anyone, but we're only on a, on a beta mainnet here. So that's okay for now. We're going to just get our tokens for free from this faucet. But um, when you take the private key, you bring it over here to the build tool and you use the build tools import function. So we've clicked on accounts here. Excuse me, just log myself out then. Um, we click on the uh, accounts section here and then we click import and just simply paste in the private key. However, one thing to remember, make sure that you just prefix it with zero X as stated here, otherwise that won't work. Okay, so I've already done that. And so once you've gone ahead and done that, you'll have that new account here as the default account and you fill out your contract name, what you want the, you know, the name of your contract to be and what you want the symbol to be and advise leaving the decimals at 18 because that's the standard and your initial supply, obviously, if you strip off 18 uh, decimals from here, then that leaves you with your actual token supply. All right, so let's go ahead and compile that. And this build tool creates for us an ABI and also the bytecode, but we don't actually need to do anything with that. All we need to do is come up here to this drop down. This is very important. There's a lot of inheritance in this contract. So the actual TIM10 token has a combination of all these things um, here that it inherits from. But what we want to do is make sure we select that one before we hit deploy. And then when we click deploy, so we make sure we're on the right um, account. So let's go to this one I've created earlier, this Tim account, and I've already gone to the faucet over here. So of course you would come here, um, click I'm not a robot, put your account address in and get your one uh, free uh, OETH. And then once you've done that, obviously your wallet will have some uh, funds in it and then you can go ahead and deploy this to the Oasis mainnet beta. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now as my Tim user. Okay. And what that's done is it's created for us a address on the blockchain where the ERC 20 contract has been deployed. So that's fantastic. All right. So now let's head over to the Uniswap exchange. All right, so the first thing we need to do, because this token is brand new to the blockchain network, we need to go into the pool tab and we need to actually create an exchange because we've got a new token. We've been issued with, um, with some tokens that are now in our wallet and we first have to create an exchange and then we or anybody else can add liquidity to that. All you need is a set of network tokens and some of these tokens and then you can create liquidity. So. Let's first things first, let's pop into the MetaMask wallet, go to the assets, scroll down and click add token. Now we click on custom tokens and we paste in this and it'll actually go ahead because this um, is connected to the Oasis uh, mainnet beta. It'll detect that there's the token symbol of Tim 10 and it's got 18 decimal places and so forth. And when I click next, you'll see that they're already in there. So we click add tokens and now this wallet is aware of uh, everything there and how to set up your MetaMask wallet. Uh, you have a, a bunch of different networks that you can select from here. You go to uh, settings and you scroll right down to networks and then you can actually um, create networks in here and you can just paste in the um, RPC URL. So you can actually steal that up from over here on the build tool in the provider section. If you just take this, uh, URL here, 
you can go over to MetaMask and actually create a new uh, network and then just paste that in and, and click accept and then you're basically on the Oasis network. All right, so over to the Uniswap exchange. Now we have the token, the Tim10 token in our wallet, so that's great. And we're going to create an exchange. All right, so we put the token address in of the Tim10 token and also Uniswap you can see has detected it. So we click create exchange. This comes up with uh, confirmation to get that done. Okay, and that shouldn't take more than a couple of seconds. Uh, Okay, so now the next step is to add some liquidity to that pool. So the token here is the network token, so we'll not do something like 0 0.05 because we only have one of these tokens. So we'll go select a token, select the TIN10. This is saying that you're the first person to add liquidity. So what we need to do is make sure that in the real world that this uh, deposit here has an equal um, value to the uh, tokens that we're going to also put in here. So first of all, we go ahead and unlock that in Uniswap and that's just basically giving Uniswap permission to um, spend. Okay, that also should only just take a couple of seconds to go ahead. If that unlock doesn't disappear, um, if you find that the unlock mechanism is um, is sticking or delaying, then just after a little while, just feel free to refresh um, your page. Now you can actually keep an eye on the uh, transactions that are going on in here, because if you go to activity, you'll see that on this account. So we've created an exchange and then we've approved. So you'll see in here whether it's pending or failed or what have you, but so that's gone ahead. So if you don't see that um, this user interface, um, match the wallet software then just feel free to hit refresh or something like that okay so let's go ahead and put in some initial liquidity so we'll put 0 0.05 and maybe a hundred of these tokens here and that gives us the ratios we click add liquidity as the first liquidity providers we'll click ok and then again we wait a couple of seconds for that okay that's gone ahead and so now we have 100% uh, of this pool share because obviously we're the first person to put any liquidity into the pool. And now we can go ahead over here and we can swap. Um, so we'll take um, perhaps this network token here, we'll put 0 0.05 again, and we can actually swap. So now you'll see that the, um, the swap ratio here is set because we've added that initial liquidity. So now we actually have um, a value here. The transaction details will show you all about that. Okay, so that's basically it. Once you've done that, you can go ahead and start swapping um, tokens. You can also, if you want to just send tokens to different accounts, um, you can do that if you want to send a token. So you'll scroll down here to the Tim10 and maybe I want to put in an address of another user that I'm working with or something like this and we want to um, play with another account and we can actually go ahead and transfer tokens from my account to their account and then they can come back and trade them in Uniswap and things like that. So very flexible. Um, I think that's about all to show you for today. So hopefully that gets you across the line with the hackathon, create and deploy an ERC20 tokens on the Oasis mainnet beta. Thanks for watching.